Hi, everyone. It's Katie Couric here to tell you that my podcast, Next Question, is back with a whole new season. New guests, new topics, same curious me. My next question. My next question. My next question. So here's my next question. I want to talk about all the things, like how we're going to get to a post-COVID world. Can you even imagine it? How to heal from the trauma of this year and how to find and share joy despite it all. Join me for season three of Next Question with Katie Couric. New episodes every Thursday. Subscribe and listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Bob Left Sets Podcast. My guest today is Dexter Holland of The Offspring. Dexter, good to have you. Thank you. Great to be here. So, Dexter, you've been vaccinated against COVID-19? Yes, I have. Two shots. And when did you get the shot? Uh, a couple months ago now. And has it changed your behavior? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think we were always on the cautious side, but I think it's just such a mental relief to not be worrying about the, the small chance that you might die. Do you know anybody who died? Uh, people who know people. You know, uh, our guitar player's uh, mother-in-law, for example, actually passed away from covid so it, it, it hits home it's close enough that's for sure and you could you know you could you could kind of feel the circle tightening you know before it was like i don't know anyone who's even gotten it and then all of a sudden oh that guy got it and that guy got it and then pretty soon it was this person died and it was uh it was feeling kind of kind of scary around the holidays and in your circle how many people got it uh i mean uh, 10 maybe half a dozen something like that anybody really close to you uh, yeah, my, my buddy's wife, I guess it would be like that close. Okay, so why do you think everybody's so, not everybody, but 30%, 40% of the country is so reluctant to get vaccinated? Right, right. Well, I mean, geez, we could go into a whole thing about that. Well, right? I know, you're, the reason I'm asking you all this is not <laughs> you know, only do you interact with the public, but you're someone who actually knows the science. Yes, I have a, I have a doctorate in molecular biology, which is sort of like a, biotech, I guess you'd call it. And uh, I focused on the HIV virus. So um, I know a little bit about virology. You know, what I know is more the nuts and bolts of, you know, how virus actually works and latches on and that stuff. You know, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'm certainly not an expert. But I mean, I think vaccine reluctance, I mean, it's a, it's a distrust of government, distrust of authority. And, and that goes back to, you know, Watergate, I guess. I don't know exactly how far back you want to go, but I, and and certainly the last administration didn't help that at all. I think it encouraged people to to not want to be part of these kinds of things because they feel like they're going to be controlled or there's a chip in the vaccine. Okay, uh, certainly as you get into harder rock, there are more right wing fans. Is this something you experience amongst your fan base, or something you might worry about? Uh, that's a great question. <clears throat> I mean, of course, there's, you know, the Ted Nugent's of the world and all, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the, the, our world is more of what I would call a, a punk rock world. And it, it really is different. Like the only guys with doctorates I know are in punk bands, not not the rock stuff. So we're not really exposed to the right wing stuff too much, I don't think. So why do you think the punk rockers have doctorates and the other people don't? <laughs> that is a great question. We were talking about that just the other day. Like, what is it that this, I, I, maybe it's, uh, you know, it's not fuck authority. It's question authority, I guess. Right. You know, ask questions. And and uh, there was just something, you know, that was I think was intellectually stimulating about the punk rock that we we're listening to when we grew up. And you could all say, I mean, for those of us who lived through the era, it was definitely a turn away from what was existing. That's why, you know, they did it to begin with. You know, the Ramones, very basic, very short songs. So it, you know, this creativity is inspiration more than execution. So I agree with you. It took a lot of intelligence and risk to make punk rock. <laughs> I'm not trying to say we're the smart guys necessarily, but I mean, when I was growing up, you know, the rock, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Sunset Strip scene at the time was very much top down with the girl and all that kind of stuff. And it was bands like the Sex Pistols that I was way more drawn to because it was heavy and it was political and it felt more, I don't know, substantive, I guess. Okay, let's talk about the new album. 
So there hasn't been an album for years. How did you finally decide to release a new one? I know. Uh, well, it's not just being lazy. Uh, it was actually being kind of busy and um, just kind of not putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to make the record. I think that there's kind of a natural pressure once you start releasing records that like, oh my gosh, we have to put out something every two to three years or we'll be obsolete. It will be forgotten and stuff. And that's kind of a hard thing to to live with, feeling like you're under pressure to create. Um, pressure is not usually good for creativity. And we do tour quite a bit. We're on the road almost four months of every year. So um, when we get home, it was harder to fit in the studio time. But I, I mean, really, I think I, I just wanted to feel like the songs felt good and it felt like the right record for the right time. And and that's really what finally happened just this last year is it felt like these are the things I want to sing about. And I feel good about these songs and it feels like the right time for this record. Now, the record is got 12 songs, but it's pretty short. Thirty three minutes. Was that conscious? Well, I mean, we felt like it was long enough. We could have put out, we could have, you know, spent another six months or a year and done a couple more songs, I guess, but it felt like it was okay. I don't know. I asked Peter Paterno. He said it was all right. <laughs> no, <laughs> <He> was, <laughs> Peter Paterno is the lawyer that we share. No, I thought it was brilliant and it was only still, because it's got 12 songs, it's like, a, you know, an album of the past. It's digestible. You know, once we used to have vinyl records, there were two sides. There were four crucial tracks, the first and last track on each side. Once we went to CDs, it was essentially one side and it was interminable. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you had only 33 minutes of music, I thought was, you know, really a throwback and a step against the relative trend. But some of your previous albums were not that short. So that's why I was asking whether it was conscious. Well, I mean, we wanted to keep it. Uh, tight, I guess, you know, short and sweet, make sure all the songs counted and there wasn't filler. And, you know, that's the worst to think like, oh, we need to come up with five more minutes so fans don't complain it's too short. Like, that's not the right standpoint, viewpoint to come from. Okay. But the time, the album was done before COVID, or wasn't it? It was. We had finished it pretty much right before. And I think we even had a, a single release date of last May. And we, uh, had the record done. We went down to South America to do some shows and that's when the pandemic started. They were literally canceling shows around us in Brazil and then Argentina. We did manage to pull off one show in Chile before they said tours over and you better scramble to get home because they might close the airports. So we got home just barely in time. And, you know, within a couple of weeks you could feel that it didn't feel like the right time to put out an album. So we just kind of, we kind of tweaked it actually. We didn't just put it on the shelf. We kind of went back and did some remixes and, I'm, I'm, in retrospect, I'm glad we spent the time because it actually did come up a notch. That's that's a, a real thing uh, in in the industry when you're doing a record and you, you have to have it finished by a deadline. And there is a certain point where you do let things go. You don't always take things that last maybe 10% that you wish you could. And this is one of those times where we actually had the chance to do that. Okay, now the paradigm amongst the let's call it the Spotify top 50 is really changed where there's not a focus on album. There's a focus on endless singles. Is that something you thought about is the old paradigm was, you know, there were years between releases. Uh, you know, I, I, our old producer Dave said, look, you guys are partly a punk band and partly a pop band. He goes, and I feel like if you were just one or the other, you probably wouldn't be as successful. He goes, it's the idea that you have both. So we've always, put songs on there that I felt weren't just standard punk songs. And that was important to me, not just in an effort to be commercially successful, but I, I felt like it was just something creatively I wanted to do. I wanted to, to not just feel like I'm doing the same thing or rehashing, or I've got this one small niche and that's what we're going to stick to. So in that sense, uh, uh, I guess you're conscious of it, but you know, I was thinking about this the other day, not knowing where you were going to go in terms of musical history. But, you know, when I was growing up, it was all about the 45, you know, like, uh, you know, those little, those little pieces of plastic that people Believe used to me, listen I know. to. <laughs> and, you know, when I was old enough to start becoming aware of music, my, my, uh, my parents at this point had been accumulating 10 years of 45s. There were stacks and we used to go through them. And, you know, back then it was, it was everything. It was, you know, Jimmy Rogers kisses sweeter than wine and honeycomb. And I, I was digging through trying to find Snoopy versus the red Baron and all that kind of stuff. So it was very much a singles kind of 
world back then. The album thing didn't really come along till much later. Okay, so on this new album, you do a, well, we can call it a cover, but it's your original song. You do another version of Gone Away. What inspired you to put that on the album? It started as just a live thing. We thought that with all the heaviness in our songs and our set, it'd be nice to just have a breather in the middle of the show. And so well, let's redo a song in a much quieter way. And that seemed like the the natural choice. You know, Gone Away is a song that we did uh, in a heavy way on our Extend on the Aubrey record. And um, we thought doing it on piano would kind of add a personalness to it. Uh, something in the, you know, that makes the vocal more apparent and the songs about, you know, losing someone, it's about grief. So it had a message that I thought would be good to approach that way on the on the piano so it was kind of like a oh, well let's what the hell let's see what happens when we played it live the, the reaction was pretty instant it was you know lighters up in the air and a lot of comments on social media saying this makes the song even more meaningful to me and where can i get a recorded version of this so it was kind of almost like fans demand that kind of inspired us to go and try to record it well if you go online you can see youtube versions of you playing it with the band on the piano but the version on the album is similar yet different in that it's produced. It has strings, et cetera. Whose decision was to add all that? Well, we had, when we play it live, I start on the piano and it felt right to have the band kick in at the end. And that felt really good. When we got into the studio, uh, somehow that, that approach felt flat. It didn't feel like it had the emotion. And I was thinking about, how can I approach this? Uh, I mean, it's kind of a funny story because there's a lot of what goes on in the studio talking to Bob about this. Like, what do we do? What do we do? And I said, you know, what? a great song, just vocal and piano is Joe Cocker. You are so beautiful. Like, what is it about that song? And, and Bob explained to me all the things that he felt made that song work, the way the piano moves and how it gets out of the way of the vocal in certain spots and how strings come in. And I thought, you know, that's great. Let's let's use that as our inspiration uh, for the way we want to frame this song. And we took it from there. So how long did it take you to perfect it? Uh, yeah, a few months, I guess we work in a different way. You know, back in the day, it was like, you're going to book the studio for three months and you're never going to come out until this record's done. And I felt kind of burned out doing it that way. And I think that there's a certain point where you run out of ideas and then you're kind of just staring at each other, trying to figure out how to finish the song. So what we do now is we go in for a couple weeks at a time. We go through all the ideas and hash it out. And then it's like, okay, that's all I got for right now. And then we go home and sit on it for a month. And then by the time we get back together for a couple weeks again, I've got lots of ideas to carry it forward. It's much more short spurts. Well, I certainly know that Bob is in Hawaii, Bob Rock, the producer. Now, uh, there's always the issue of studio. I see you're in a studio now. Do you cut it in your own studio or do you book a different studio? We do now. This is uh, our studio in Huntington Beach. We used to go to L.A., of course, to do it. And this kind of started as a demo studio. But as the technology improved and Bob kept on coming down, we added to the equipment and the whole thing until now. We're pretty self-sufficient here. We can do everything, including mix. So if you decide you want to go in, it's not like you have to worry about booking the time. It's always available. It's always available. It's just kind of getting schedules together with Bob. He has other other things that he works on as well, of course. And so what's the reaction been since the album's come out of the new version of Gone Away? It feels really good. And I was not sure about that because it's it will sound like a departure compared to our other material. And you're never sure how you're your audience is going to react to something that's so different, but maybe just because we've been around long enough, people, we can get away with it more. It's been, been very, very good so far. Well, it's an astounding listen. It reminds me of when Green Day, and I hate to compare acts, but there I did, when they went into that mode, okay? This is a song not solely for alternative. This is a song that could be for everyone. Is the label thinking about that? Are you thinking about it that, you know, we have this in our pocket at some time. We're going to try to expose it to a larger audience. I would love to. Uh, I think I've brought it up to the label. Hey, can you make sure you listen to the last song on the record, too? I think it's pretty good. We'll see. See what, no, no, what happens just, to it. You only listen once. And it is the same song as the one you recorded earlier on Ixnay. But it's really a different record. And it affects you. I mean, this is really a one listen 
All of a sudden, you know, some things are just so in the pocket. You know, I think a couple of those foreigner songs, you know. Uh, <laughs> waiting for a girl sure. like you, I want to know what love is. You only yeah. have to hear it once and you go, wait a second. This is something everybody can <laughs> yeah. relate to. Yeah. Well, th- oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember a guy five years ago saying, hey, you know, my, my buddy down the street passed away. And boy, I sure would love to play that piano version at his memorial. Do you have that? And we hadn't recorded it yet. So, but I thought how interesting that in his mind, a song like this would f- would would feel right in that kind of heavy experience. So I know what you mean about uh, a different audience, I guess. Right. Okay. But the song was based on a real situation, correct? I mean, yes. Yeah. yeah yes and no. Don't don't really talk about that too much. Yes and no. I mean, documentation would say that you had a girlfriend who passed away in a car accident. Is that factually true? No, it's not. It's not. Uh, well, I, I, what the hell? I'll tell the story, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I was with my wife on a Sunday, and we had gone to dinner, and we were going to um, Baskin Robbins for our after dinner, whatever, ice cream and drive home. And this is, you know, just on Huntington Beach where we live. And so we're waiting in line, and there's 10 people in the store. A couple runs in. They, they go, call the police. Someone's chasing us with a gun. And... We're like, what the hell? What's going on? <clears throat> All of a sudden, shots rang out. So, the, these these people in this in this car, they had been chased by gang gang bank, gang members in another car, who were mad at them for some reason. They ran into the store. These guys decided to shoot up the store. So, I mean, they it looks like they shot high. I don't think they actually intended to kill anybody. But anyway, all of a sudden here we are, and it's one of those like strip malls where it's it's a complete glass you know front to the store, shooting it, and uh, all of a sudden it's like, well, fuck, I'm we're gonna die, right? <laughs> and <laughs> you know, in hiding, trying to you know get behind a trash can or something, not even knowing where the bullets are coming from, and it turns out I was right in front of the gunman or whatever. But you know, and then crawling over to my wife and you know putting my body on top of hers and just knowing like. So I'm going to get shot any second here. I'm going to get shot. And, you know, there were several shots that rang out. The whole front was, was, was what, you know, was shot out. And uh, luckily no one was hurt. So I think they just wanted to have fun and scare everybody. Right. I don't think they're really trying to kill anybody, but I think just the, the, I, the idea that we came so close to death was a real life changing moment. And it was right when we were recording Ixnay and uh, I, I was coming up with the, I, the idea, I knew I wanted the song to be heavy, but I didn't know what it was going to be about yet. But it was kind of like the feeling of, in, in, a, in a weird way, I know it's not a direct connection, if you know what I mean, but it made you think about, you know, about dying and about grief and about what that would feel like. And, and what, if, what if my wife had been the one? Okay. So the incident happens. How long after that do you write the song and does it come to you in a flash or something takes a long time to work out? Oh, I wrote it in the next week. It was quick. Yeah, it was it was done in a few days. And the lyrics, how long did it take you to write the lyrics? A few days. Yeah, quick okay. quick for me. Quick for you. Okay, so you were you grew up where? I grew up in Garden Grove, which is in Orange County. Okay, Garden Grove is how far from the beach? About five miles. Okay, so what was it like growing up in Garden Grove? Uh, right. I mean, it was very suburban. It was, uh, I would say we grew up middle class and not like upper middle class or lower middle class, just kind of kind of right in the middle. And it, and it was suburban in that way with the green lawns and the the picket fences and everyone kind of kind of being the same, right? And, and uh, I think there was something about that because people say, well, why do so many punk rock bands come out of Orange County? It seems like this Republican place where everything's nice and mellow. And I think that there was something in the, homogeneity something in the sameness the 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 boredom of that that inspired the rebellion that you see in in these bands i don't know how else to explain it okay what'd your parents do for a living uh my mother was a school teacher and my father was a hospital administrator okay did you go to the school where your mother was the administrator no never did never did okay did you go to public school private school yeah, regular regular old public school in Garden Grove. Grew and up there. how many how many kids in the family? Four total: uh, an older brother and sister, and a younger brother. Okay, so you're in the middle. In the middle. So you, traditionally, in the middle, the attention is on the oldest and the youngest, and you're kind of lost in the shuffle, doing your own thing. What was your experience? 
Uh, I think so. You know, I'm the third. So by the time that comes around, they've given up on communion and all that stuff. And they're like, you, you do have a, maybe a little more freedom, I think, which, which I liked. So you start going to school. What's your experience there? Uh, uh, you know, I, I did well at school. I, I, I liked it. I, I, I don't mean to hesitate, but it always sounds weird. Cause I remember always being, as you grew up doing well in school was not cool. Right. So you're, right. You're, you're hesitating to frame your answer. So you don't say something right. Like, a, a dumbing down your words or whatever that was definitely a, a a part of it but um but uh i i liked i liked learning okay so you go to school and you do well are you aware of the fact that you're on the upper end of the class and how does it affect your integration with the other people there um well for sure i did i did i did well so uh uh, you know, you find you, you have to find your own group, your own clique, right? And that's a an ugly process. In junior high, you're not you're. It's a one big group, or, or I mean, in elementary, it's one big group. Junior high is where it starts to separate and get weird, and you feel like you don't have a place. And I think in high school, hopefully, you f- eventually find your group. And it was the group that I started hanging out with that uh, we eventually formed the band from. Okay, and what? How did that group fit in in the high school? Uh, we ran cross country. You're a cross country. How did that come together? (laughs) I don't know. I just, I I always liked distance running. Uh, And so started doing it in high school. I was never good or anything, but, uh, but I liked it and did it all four years. And that was kind of our click ended up being that. And it turned out that we all liked punk rock also. So we were like this, these guys that, you know, liked punk rock and we ran across country, but we didn't have mohawks and leather jackets. So we kind of didn't even fit in with the punkers. We were our own little weird group and stuff. So I know it's very fashionable to say, well, we never fit in. That's why we are who we are. But it really was pretty, it was true in our case. Okay. You were punk rockers. In your case, when did you start playing an instrument? Um, I think I was 14. My, uh, my, my mother came home from school and saw me sitting on the couch too many days in a row. And she's like, you're doing something. You're going to start playing piano. And uh, so she she made me take piano for about a year. And after a year, I felt like it wasn't cool being 15 and going into high school and playing piano, which is, you know, a a dumb idea now. But uh, she let me off and I went into cross country instead. But I'm really glad now, of course, that she forced me to uh, to do that. There, there, There might not be a gone away version, for example, if I if we hadn't done that. Okay, do you know how to read music? I mean, I could I could count down the lines and go, I think that's a C, but no, I guess is the answer. Okay, so you're running cross country and you're punk rock fans. At what point do you say, hey, maybe we can form a band? Right. Uh, well, yeah, punk rock fans, you know, we loved bands like the Dead Kennedys and the Ramones and all that kind of stuff. I think it was when we first heard a band from Orange County called TSOL that it kind of took it to the next level. It, it was almost like, oh, well, wait a minute. I don't just like that. I, I want to be that. I, 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 w- I want to start a band. So that happened when we were about 17. But we didn't, we didn't play instruments. That's the, the story is that we, we went to a show, couldn't get in. It was actually a social distortion show in Irvine. And then we ended up at somebody's house saying, well, shoot, maybe we should start a band. <laughs> it's like, well, we don't play instruments. Like, oh, what the hell? Let's start a band anyway. And we actually like divvied up parts at night. Well, what do you want to play? I'll play bass. I'll play guitar. And that is literally how the band started. And then we went out and asked our parents to buy us guitars. Okay, let's before we leave high school. So what was your uh, relationship with girls during high school and junior high? Uh, awkward, <laughs> for sure. I don't know. I think we were, you know, we were typical kids. I don't think we really had girlfriends so much until maybe, you know, senior year of high school, that sort of thing. I'm Allie Wentworth, mom, wife, actress, writer, comedian, and also the host of Go Ask Allie, the podcast that dissects the craziness of modern life. He said, I never thought anybody could be this irreplaceable. And I started crying and he started crying. And that, that was it. Yes, it's terrible and all this traveling and it just completely disrupts our lives. But 
this is what we got. Go Ask Allie is a podcast where you can learn how to grow all the pivotal relationships in your life. We are taking ukulele lessons on Zoom and we suck. We're never forming I, a band. By the way, I assumed that. I didn't okay, want to I say did. anything. I, I assumed right. you sucked until you told me otherwise. There will be ruptures in any intimate, loving relationship. And the question is, how do you repair? New episodes drop every Thursday, and there's also a bunch already waiting for your binging pleasure. You all made a present. Yeah, I know. Listen to Go Ask Allie on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Man, I, I gotta get out of my head and pay attention or I'll miss my transfer. I think I'm all worked up because of what's coming up tonight. Yo, Ruben, you got this. It's gonna be huge. Huge, huge. For my heart radio, Def Jam, and Double Elvis, this is Here Comes the Break. I even got a secret identity. On the podcast, I go by a stage name, Mask On. Sounds like you're on that Miles Morales tip. You're the most interesting new kid we've had in years. It's strange having low-key celebrity status. I can get used to it. Ruben, where were you tonight? Don't lie to us, young man. You were the one who wanted to disguise your voice and hide your name. Now you want all the credit? Ruben, come on. Be you real here. Trust, You're letting trust, this trust. viral fame go to your head. Oh, okay. Let, let me stop tripping. I'll put in my earbuds. Ready or not, here comes the break. break, 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 break. Starring Asante Black and Daniela Perkins, Here Comes the Break is a mix of music discovery and storytelling you've never heard before. Listen to Here Comes the Break on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. So what is the instrument you're supposed to play when you divvy it up? It was going to be the guitar. Guitar. And so we picked, you know, drums, guitar, bass. Nobody said, I'm going to be the singer. We kind of, we weren't sure how to treat that. So I think we all left that alone. And I think we all sort of maybe dabbled in it here and there. And, you know, over the next year, um, it turned out it was going to be me. Okay. So you're going to get, you go home and you say, mom and dad, I want a guitar. It was my Christmas present. And uh-huh. how did you how did you decide what guitar you want? <laughs> we went to the music store and asked. It was it was a Hondo. It cost ninety nine dollars, and Hondos are not known for being great guitars. And he he gave a, a he had me buy this amp called uh, a Bassman uh, for ninety nine dollars also. Or my dad bought it, <clears throat> and uh, it turns out it's really not a guitar amp. It's a bass amp. And uh, our our bass player also got a bass for Christmas, and they bought him a PV backstage, which is a really a guitar amp. So we kind of got together first practices, and after a month or two, realized we were playing the wrong amp. So we we switched. Okay, so you get the guitar. You don't know how to play. No. So not how a lick. do you learn how to play? Not a lick. You know, you you sit you sit down, and you fiddle with it. The way I really did it was, I sat on my bed and I put on the LPs that I loved. It was it was bands like TSOL, of course, and the Ramones and and stuff like that, and kind of just listened and tried to figure out what they were doing, um, and 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 mimic it. Okay, but. If you know nothing, it's not as easy. It's not like there are pictures back then. <laughs> it was, it you know, a, there's the key, there's the tuning, you know, there's the notes. There's a lot of shit going on. It was a bitch. Well, I mean, I, I had a guitar practice book, and it's like, well, try these scales, these exercises. And I hated it. That wasn't interesting to me at all, the the theory or the the scales. Like, I wanted to play punk rock. That's what I wanted to do. So I used those books enough to figure out how to tune the guitar. And then sometimes maybe in a song you could figure out, I mean, chords were beyond me, but if there was a single string melody, I could probably figure that out. That was the first thing. And then I kind of realized it was going to be bar chords. That was going to be important to learn. And I just couldn't figure it out. And it was actually by looking on the back of a record cover, I saw a guy in a band that I loved playing a bar chord. And the thing is he had his thumb pressed against the back of the neck. That's how you keep your fingers on the, but I had not, I, I had just never figured that out. I hadn't taken lessons and it was like, aha. So in a way, these, these bands that I loved really taught me how to play guitar. Okay. And how, so everybody got an inch, everybody did what they said they were going to do. Yes. And how long after you got the instruments, did you play together? Uh, I think in the next month, what became apparent is that some of us, I mean, we were all really terrible. Um, but some of us were never going to get it. <laughs> like our, our drummer was, he was never going to be able to figure out how to play the drums. And, you know, he had fun with it for a while. And then um, he actually, well, we're, this is um, the January before we graduated. So by June, we've graduated. He got a girlfriend. 
he didn't want to be the play the drums anymore. He was having more, <laughs> he was having more fun with his with his girlfriend and stuff. And our guitar player didn't work out too well either. So it was that kind of thing and trying to find another guy in the neighborhood to play drums. And eventually we ended up with a lineup uh, two years later that that stick together for for seventeen years. Okay, so the guy bought a whole drum kit and then stopped playing. <laughs> he did. He didn't. He didn't care. Didn't care about it that much. Okay. And you're in high school. Is it true that you were the valedictorian? Yes, I was a valedictorian. Okay. So that begs the question, what'd you get on your SATs? Jeez, it was, um, it was different back, back then, the, the way it was scored. Right. Um, the math was always easier for me, uh, but I think it was, a, uh, it was a 1350. So what is that? Like It was like a 700 and a 650, I think, something okay. like that. Okay. How'd you end up deciding to go to USC? Um, I really felt tight with the guys you're hanging out with and the idea of starting over in another state. I just, I felt like I wanted to stay closer to home to go to school. So to me, that meant um, either USC or UCLA. Um, I thought I was interested in the Air Force Academy because I wanted to fly, but um, I had... Uh, I had to wear glasses or contacts, so I was going to be eliminated from the pilot category. So I, I, I nixed that off the list, and I applied to both USC and UCLA. They both admitted me, and the UCLA, uh, UCLA letter, I'm not bagging on UCLA, by the way, but they said, congratulations, we're in, we'll see you in October. The USC letter said, congratulations, you're in, we'd love to welcome to your reception, and we want to talk to you about a scholarship, and please come hang out with us and here talk to this guy, this professor. So they were, they were very much recruiting but um but it really made me feel much more wanted at usc so did you get a scholarship at usc i did i got a couple of them that um <clears throat> again i don't know how my parents would have afforded i don't think they could have but um my scholarships paid about 75 percent of my tuition so you didn't have to borrow any money no my parents were able to handle the other 25 percent and then did you live on campus or near campus mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Lived in the dorms the first year and then on uh, student housing the other three years. Let's go back a chapter. What was your valedictorian speech? Uh, <laughs> well, in all fairness, there were they didn't have AP classes then. So there were uh, there were three people that had all A's 4.0 was as, as much as you could get back then. And so we all had to give a speech. And mine was just kind of like I didn't I, I, frankly, I didn't feel comfortable being on stage for a long uh, speech. So I kept it short. I just kind of said, hey, everybody, you know, we've all got, we all have a, sh a shot at success. Please, you know, keep that in mind and, and make the most of your chance. Okay. When you go to USC, is the dream to be a rock star? No, I was pre-med. I thought I was interested in surgery. Um, cardiac surgery really appealed to me. I thought at the time, you know, w when you think you have something in mind that you want to do, as you know, it's hard to know. Sometimes it feels natural and it stays that way. And sometimes once you learn about it, you're like, oh, actually, I'm not sure if I love it as much as I thought I did. So uh, I was interested in, in medicine and uh, you, you don't major in medicine. You major in biology, usually, uh, if you're going to take that path. So that's what I was doing. But I was starting to become really into the band and I was really excited about this. Um, you know, we had now been playing guitars for six months <laughs> and maybe we were going to write a song or something. So uh, uh, I would come home on the weekends and that's how we did our, our band practices. We would we would jam every weekend, all weekend. OK, so at this point, it's the solid members for 17 years. When do you play your first gig for money? Yeah, no, sorry. We, we had been a, our first guys. Yeah, I mean, if we're going back to the beginning of the band, um, it was just a couple years. Um, I, the first show that I can remember is was a show in Santa Cruz where we opened for another punk band called White Flag and and having, you know, terrible stage fright and there was only 40 people there and um, it was terrifying and it was exciting and it was exhilarating and uh, it was everything I wanted because it was like you're with your buddies you're driving away somewhere for the weekend. You're drinking beer. You're it, it, it's an this adventure. It was really what it was. the The money was completely not important at all. It'd be great if you get your gas covered, but I think we got forty dollars. How'd you get a gig in Santa Cruz? Uh, 
You know, I, I've started looking around, really trying whatever I could find. A big resource back then were the fanzines, fanzines like Flipside Magazine and stuff. And they would say, here's a booking agent or here's a promoter. Or they would talk about shows around the country and say, here's this club in Santa Cruz that's had shows. And we would call them up ourselves and say, hey, can we can we get a show? And maybe send them a, a demo tape. Okay. And at this point, you're playing at Santa Cruz all originals? Yeah. Yeah, all originals. How do you write those songs and did any of them make the cut <laughs> further down the line? I don't think so. I think, let me see if I can even remember all these. I felt like it, it's kind of this joke, but like, look, if you're going to start a punk band, there's four songs you got to write right away. There's four bases you got to cover. One of them is an anti-police song. One of them is an anti-war song. Uh, one of them is a uh, I'm depressed and I want to die song. And the fourth one is My Girlfriend's a Bitch. <laughs> So those, those were the first four songs that we wrote, I think. Okay, so you play in Santa Cruz, you have a good weekend. What's the next step after that? Uh, it, it was getting shows wherever we could. It was really hard in those days because there were no steady venues, especially for for punk rock, right? I mean, the, the sunset scene was kind of happening, but we were never going to get a show at the Whiskey A Go-Go, and we couldn't draw anybody anyway. I mean, even the anti-club, I thought, was the punkest club in LA and they didn't want to book us. They're like, yeah, we're not really booking punk bands. So uh, it, as you probably remember, these shows would pop up once in a while at a VFW hall or something. It was like, maybe if you're lucky, you could get on one gig and then the place would go, you know, cause the cops would show up and there'd never be another show again. So that was something we chased around for a few years. And it was really Gilman street opening up in Berkeley, which provided um, a steady venue, a venue that stuck around and we could go up there every, you know, three times a year, maybe. And so we actually sort of developed a following up there just by virtue of there being a steady place. The venue was so important. Okay. And who was the business guy in the band? I mean, we all did a little bit of it. I, I definitely had a lot to do with it. Because usually the drummer is the business guy and you're not the drummer. <laughs> no, no, no. No, our drummer uh, was, uh, he was, he was the youngster in the band. He was five years younger. So a little bit different dynamic. Okay. So when does the lineup formalize? Uh, like what year? No. Yeah. Now how far into you, you start playing in January, your senior year yeah. of high school. At yeah. what point does the f group formulate in the 17 year run? Right. Two years, two years later, we had the four guys that we stayed. Okay. So you have two years. Everybody's serious about it. Every, or they just say, well, I'm doing this. Uh, I think we were serious, but we had no, uh, expectations. I think the idea was like, look, there's no punk band that's going to make a million dollars or sell a million records or that, that just, it, it doesn't exist in the universe. So we loved what we did. And I, and I definitely was felt strongly about pursuing it and trying to to be to make the most of it and be whatever we could be but it was it was going to be it was a small a low bar i guess okay and you were in college the other members what were they doing uh it, co uh, college uh uh bass player greg uh full-time college uh, noodles was part-time college and full-time working and uh i think ron the drummer was going to a technical school so uh, students mostly Okay, and at what point do you say, oh, we're going to put a demo, try to pursue this more seriously? You know, recording was really important to me from the very beginning. So even before we had the four guys together, uh, I would go to a studio and just work with an engineer for $10 an hour. I, I remember that the, the first guy, he was in Placentia, and he lived at his mom's house, and he converted his garage in a regular suburban house to a studio, and that's where we cut our first songs so if i had to play more than one instrument i would just do it and i didn't know how to play drums but we did the best we could and so we were putting songs together from the very beginning okay and when did you start to shop a tape well when you say shop <laughs> when did you say we have a tape and we're either going to put yeah. it out ourselves or find someone else to put it out yeah it's not like you get a manager and an agent. It's not that kind of, it's way down low. Right. So I think that at first it was just to circulate to friends. If we got a show, we'd either give them away or, you know, I found a, there was a 25 pack you could get for $25. So I would be, we would dub tapes and, and either charge a dollar or give them out. They'd also be kind of like your audition tape. If you wanted to get a, a show at like 
there was a club here in Huntington called Safari Sam's and uh, you could send a demo tape there to try to get booked. So uh, as far as selling them, geez, I guess, you know, we did put an ad in Flipside magazine. Like, hey, buy our demo tape for $2 or whatever. But it was at that at that level, just selling tapes out of the back of a magazine. And what was the next big step? We decided to make our own single. Uh, and it's not that we wouldn't have loved to have a label do it for us, but it just wasn't an option. There wasn't the interest from anybody. So uh, we decided to record our own. It was a, it was a seven inch with two songs. And we did that in, in yeah, 1986. And we made a thousand copies of it, of it. And we were very excited. We didn't know how we were going to sell a thousand copies. That was, that was like, you know, crazy number to get but that was like the lowest quantity i think you could order but the the deal was that it was so it was all the money we had just to get impressed that the sleeve part wasn't included um you had to do that separately or pay a lot for it so we actually got these record jackets printed up a thousand of them and we had to glue them together ourselves (laughs) (laughs) so we assembled our own singles and it was done then what you do with it we advertise in Flipside. <laughs> you know, I think we actually found that there were some small distributors at that point. I'm trying to think of their names, but you know, along the lines of a Caroline or whatever, that would they would actually say, oh, "I'll take 50 of them." So we were selling like little bundles of 50 to 100. Um, I think I don't know if we ever sold through them, but um, I think I think they lasted mostly for about three years. So the distributors didn't return them unsold. No, no. I don't know if I really cared about that Uh, just in terms of uh, marketplace okay so what happens next a big step in the band or you graduate from college oh my gosh um graduated from college didn't get into medical school i think by that time i was kind of i don't want to say half-hearted but not a hundred percent committed to that uh and um so i didn't get into medical school and the idea was well why don't you stick around and get your master's and then you look better on paper to try to get in medical school. And I liked that idea of it. I think, you know, honestly, I liked the idea that it gave me more time to mess around with the band and stay at home. (laughs) So we did that. And about that time is when we finally got interest from a label, a record label, and we put out our first album, uh, self-titled the offspring. Okay. And at some point in this game, you have a child. What happens there? Yes, that's right. Uh, I had, had a daughter and it was a it was a tough a tough situation um but you know just kind of kind of made made the best of it i mean um you know it got better later on i guess we'll just put it that way okay so you have was it a girlfriend who got pregnant or someone you didn't know that well someone i didn't know very well okay and there was no issue of getting an abortion no no uh no so you must have been freaking out. <laughs> I was freaking out. I was freaking out. I was 23. 23. And what did so your parents say? They said, geez, you know, you could really mess up your life. <laughs> and I'm like, well, this is it. I just have to deal with what, what I've got going on. And, uh, you know, you don't want to, you don't look at it from that side. You look at it, the fact that there's, you know, there's, there's a child here you want to do your best for. And so what did you do? I mean, where'd you get the money and how involved were you with the child's life? You honestly, not very for a while, for a while. And then it was, it was, you know, several years later where, um, I, I'd made the effort to get involved and that's when, uh, that's when things got better. And did you pay support? Well, always for sure. Yeah. And yeah so where was... did you get the money to pay support? Well, I mean, you know, they base it on your income. It was still, it was a hell of a lot of my income <laughs> for sure. But, you know, back then you, you took odd jobs, worked in the summer, whatever, whatever you had to do, you know, part-time work. So how did you metabolize this or was it a, you know, a weight on your shoulder? It, I, it was just, it was, it was what it was. So no, it wasn't like that. It wasn't processed like that or a weight or anything like that. Okay. Let me ask you, do you have any tattoos? I have zero tattoos. Okay. There's obviously thought behind that. What's your thought? <laughs> I know we're probably, you know, one of the only bands. I think the, actually I think no one in the Vandals has tattoos and uh but I know so it, tattoos are so, you know, ubiquitous everywhere and and 
uh, especially as time went on. I mean, you know, in, in the 80s and 90s, maybe it was a couple here and there. And then by the time you get to the Warp Tour in the 2000s, you know, as an 18-year-old kid is completely sleeved. So it's definitely changed. But, you know, it wasn't that I didn't like them. I think they're cool. I just, I never felt strongly about any one thing that I wanted to get it tattooed on me. And I kind of thought, yeah, maybe I'll feel differently in a few years. And uh, and I also thought that, you know, I knew that, look, you're going to change. You might not love at, at 40 what you loved at, at 20. So it just never it just never appealed to me enough to go through and get one. So on some level, you say this is permanent and therefore, you know, I don't want to take a risk if it's permanent. <laughs> Well, I didn't want to, I mean, the more I thought about it, there, there was enough time like, okay, look, I don't want to be that guy with the bad Billy tattoo, right? I'd seen enough bad tattoos that people regret to know that that wasn't what I wanted to be. Okay. The first album, nothing really happens. Ultimately, you make the album with Epitaph. What is going on in your day-to-day -day life between graduated from college and before things start to come together in 94? Yes. Yeah, so I did finish the master's at, at USC and, uh, you know, my undergrad was in biology, just general biology. The master's was in molecular biology, which is like genetics. And I, I really liked the subject a lot. I thought it was really cool. It was, it was, I was interested in it. Like I could see myself going further with that. Um, I applied to medical school again and didn't get in again. Uh, I think if it had been USC, I probably would have gone and I got pretty far in the process. They interviewed me. That's like the last step when, before they decide. Um, I interviewed at a couple other places like, uh, I interviewed at Georgetown and a couple, uh, medical schools in Philadelphia, Hahnemann and Jefferson. And, uh, I think I kind of just didn't quite finish the application with those guys. I think I had a good shot probably because I'd, I'd done well on the, the MCATs and stuff. Uh, and I think again, it was that kind of like, kind of, uh, sorry, what's the word sabotaging yourself a little bit, maybe so that you don't go in a direction you don't want to go. I think subconsciously the band was important and I didn't want to let that go. So I want to try to figure out a situation where, okay, I'm not going to be one of those guys that drops out and just tries to make it in a band that just didn't seem realistic to me, but I'd like to stay in LA so I could find something that I like to do and still do the music. And what, any thought about what that might be? <laughs> yeah. Well, since I didn't get into medical school, the, the, the school at USC said, well, look, you've already got the master's. Why don't you just come back and keep on working on the doctorate? We'll, we'll let you continue, which was an amazing opportunity. And I, I loved it because I did like the subject, but I also knew that as a graduate student, you've got pretty amazing flexibility. <laughs> like if I had to go to Reno on a Thursday to play a show, I could, I could do it. I could, I could get away with it and get back and put in the time over the weekend or something. So it was actually a pretty good situation being a grad student. Okay. Come out and play. That becomes a phenomenon in LA. Jim Garano is your manager, yet he is working at A&M and then Al Cafaro goes to a program at Harvard. So the gym is literally running A&M. And all of a sudden, K-Rock picks up the record, and it becomes the biggest record on K-Rock. What is the experience from your side of the glass? It was incredible. I mean, <clears throat> you know, going from zero to 100, for sure. And especially in our case, you know, I, I, I remember bands doing interviews saying, you know, when we were first together, we could only draw 10 people until our first single came out. I mean, we drew, we drew 10 people for 10 years. Uh, I mean, the band was... 10 years in when Come Out and Play came out. And I remember right when, right before the record Smash came out, we did a hometown show and we actually drew 100 people. So that was the best we had ever done was 100 after all that time. So for this song to get on the radio and all of a sudden really connect was just, it just blew our minds. It was crazy. I mean, I, I was living in an apartment with, with my girlfriend and all of a sudden there were label guys like knocking on my door. I had no idea how they tracked me down, but A&R guys were coming to my little tiny apartment in Huntington Beach saying, hey, can I talk to you? And I go, well, I got to take out the trash. My, my girlfriend wants me to take out the trash. And they're like, well, can I take out the trash with you? <laughs> like <laughs> being, being followed around, you know? So you kind of have these moments where it feels real in, in a way that you're not sure before, you know, like, uh, 
like being in the newspaper was something that really legitimized it for my parents. Like, cause they, they were always supportive, but they were hoping it was kind of a phase for me, hoping I'd just, you know, get with it and go back to medical school or something. But when they saw us in the LA times, all of a sudden for them, it's like, Oh, okay, this is real. It finally got their seal of approval. Um, I think another moment for me was being in our kitchen. And because you live in a small apartment conflict plan complex, your kitchen window faces the guy next door's kitchen window or whatever, right? And I'm looking at him and he's on his cordless phone. And because it's, we're close enough together, I can actually hear him talking. And he's on the phone. He goes, no, dude, I'm looking at him right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, okay, this is actually, this is turning into something. Okay. So the album comes out on Epitaph and the people sniffing around in Huntington Beach are from other labels. Yeah, yeah, major labels. We're, okay, we're coming around. and what was your deal with Epitaph? We were signed, I think, for another record. Uh, that that point became a legal legal issue. But, um, you know, I was really stoked to be part of the Epitaph thing. I kind of felt like we finally found in, in you know, I was talking about finding my our social clique in high school. These are our guys. In a band sense, I felt like we had find, found that circle on Epitaph. We had become friends with um, bands like Pennywise and No Effects, Rancid, of course, and you know, Bad Religion was a couple years ahead of us, so we weren't as tight with them. But it felt like this real, real sense of community, and I didn't want to leave it. Uh, Brett Gerwitz, the owner, was really gung ho about we're going to make it, we're going to do it, you know, and he didn't want to lose us to a major um, it, because at that time, every band that got started would go to the major in the middle of the record, whether it was, you know, Beck on bond load records or Trent Reznor, like none of them finished the, their successful record at the label. They released the record initially on, and he really wanted to do it. And, and I felt kind of excited about it. And there was again, cause our friends and our buddies were there. It's kind of like this real sense of camaraderie. Like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. How did you get the deal at Epitaph? If you could only draw 40 people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Persistence. I sent uh, I sent Brett our first record that we released on the other label and he liked it but he passed and then you know uh, we played at uh, a, sh a club in Hollywood I can't remember what it's called but um, uh, he came to the show and thought we were good but kind of passed and then it was really I I decided to do another demo with four fresh new songs and one of the songs was the first song on what was going to be the record and they listened to the demo and said you're 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 going to be signed so just on the strength of a, a demo and how much money did they give you when they signed you uh you know i got to give brett credit for saying here's a contract you have to get a lawyer if you don't have a lawyer and if you can't pay for a lawyer i'll actually advance you the money to get a lawyer because you have to sign something and he marked up a couple things and sent it back but i think um the first album cost ten thousand dollars to record that was our budget okay did any how did come out and play how did that become a hit did you realize that was the song how did k-rock end up playing it yeah <clears throat> i felt it was hooky and i thought there was something about it that i had a, a gut feeling it was something that was good uh uh the epitaph took it to radio i think they kind of started just like playing it for people saying well what do you think what do you think i don't think they officially approached radio but they approached k-rock and i got the call in the afternoon i was at grad school saying well hey they listened they had their music meeting today they listened to 15 songs and they rejected them all except for yours yours is going in and it was like what and they're like you know and i think jed the fish played it on the drive home that day at five o'clock and you know luckily for us i guess because it just connected it was like there was no there couldn't be a push behind it there wasn't we were it was a small label there was no money no budget nothing like that but luckily it just it reacted right away and you know then it was that on that top five at nine it was number one it stayed there for a while okay you're living with your girlfriend in the apartment in huntington beach mm -hmm. you're going to grad school mm -hmm. all of a sudden this album blows up it's like so then what do you do yeah yeah. Well, Jim had started managing us before and I'm like, well, so what do we do? <laughs> you know, Noodles is working as literally as a custodian in an elementary school and he has child support to pay. And he's like, I can't just quit. And I, I, I didn't want to throw away my grad school and stuff. And uh, we kind of, we took it easy for a minute. And then, you know, talking to Jim, it's like, uh, you know, you're going to have to really, 
you're gonna have to go for this if you want a shot at it because this is the time you know and i'm like well, what if i finish grad school like no <laughs> a couple of years from now it'll be gone you got to go so i i quit school well i took a leave of absence they were nice enough to give me a, a leave of absence and uh and went you know started touring the thing was it was so palpable you could feel it changing week to week you know because it was k-rock one week and the next week it was geographic it would go to vegas and then it would go to phoenix and then it would go to san francisco and it was spreading that way and then you know a month or well, maybe two months later we got mtv and of course mtv is like a, a national radio station so at that point it was national and our record came out in april and by june i think we had we were in the top 20 we like hit number 20 on the album charts and i knew we were going to be okay so there was that really uncomfortable period of thinking, am I fucking up my life? But luckily for us, it was pretty quick because it, it was clear that it was going to be successful enough. Okay, so you immediately go on the road playing how often with who? What's yeah, happening? I, I, we had a booking agent in place already. Uh, just a, you know, a, a girl in her own place doing it. It wasn't like a firm or whatever. And the idea was just to do a, a club a club tour. So we were, we were going to the 500 seaters and gosh, I think we were, we were out for like six weeks, which was a long time for us. And back then you don't even, you don't know what you're capable of, what you can do. And it's all very exciting, you know, by the way too. So I think we were playing five in a row, you know, doing five nights on one night off. So a pretty grueling tour, but you know, it, it was on MTV. So by the end of that tour, I mean, every show was, was sold out. <clears throat> and, at that point, we were very comfortable playing the the three to five hundred seater, and it's still a venue that I really like because there's such a it's so easy to connect with the crowd at that at that level, you know, because you, you mean you can almost talk to them, right? And so uh, I really enjoyed that tour. And by the end of it, like I said, when you when you get a small a small club that's packed, there's an energy. I mean, it's just it's bananas, you know. It's really really great. So that was just so much fun. And then it was like, you know, off to Europe and then back. And now let's do another round of the U.S. And we're going to play, you know, small theaters, 1,000 to 1,500. And I think we ended up doing three rounds of the U.S. like that, where we ended up in palladium-sized places, 3, 000, three to 5,000. And when did you personally start to see any money? Uh, oh, gosh. I mean, it takes a while, right? It's not like you right, sell the right. record and you get and it. You may not get it at all. <laughs> you may not get it, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think it was a year before we got any real money. Um, I do remember our record came out in April and when we were in Europe, they said, congratulations guys, it sold a million and we couldn't believe it. Like, holy shit. And I think by Christmas it had sold 3 million. So we knew there was money in the pipeline, but I mean, we couldn't have spent it anyway. We were on the road. I, I think we did, we did 220 shows, I think on that record over a span of about 14 months. And the thing is you'd cover the you'd cover all the whatever the territory and then you'd have to do it again because it was a bigger thing now and then you'd have to do it again. So it was it was a lot but um you know we knew that it was the time to do it for sure. You know and and we're also you know talking to Jim he's like you should really put the work in in Europe because Europe will stay with you if you go now. And we went to Europe I think four times on that record. Okay. So how much money did you get when you got paid and what'd you do with the money? <laughs> Well, I, I bought a car. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't like gazillionaires, but maybe millionaires. <laughs> it was enough to buy a house, I think, you know, and like I said, right, we're, it's, it's a year and a half later before you're even thinking about that stuff. So, you know, I had gotten married, uh, <clears throat> you know, other guys got engaged and we all kind of figured out where we wanted to live and, and bought our first houses. Okay. Now you have to make another record. Yes. First time you're nobody. Now yeah. you have this gigantic hit. How much pressure do you feel? You try not to look at it that way, and that's what I would always say in an interview, but I think it's natural to feel it a little bit. Uh, I I feel like you maybe can't do your best work if you're coming from that place because like, it's like a mind fuck, right? You don't want to think about what they want, but you don't want to try too hard to not think about what they want. You're trying to just be what you were before, which is unknown. Um, I did know that doing smash part two felt like the wrong thing to do. Uh, I thought that that doesn't feel right. We have to, this is the time where we have to expand our, our musical circle, so to speak. We had to try something different. So that was, that was part of the thinking going into Ixnay on the Ombre. And, and, um, I think the other thing was 
the 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 recognition that this is going to be a sophomore slump. It's going to be perceived as a sophomore slump, no matter if it's good or bad. It's it's not going to be what Smash was, and trying to prepare ourselves for that, even though you know they called it soft or people call it that when a band puts out its second record after a successful one, but they're not realizing that we've put out four albums and we've been around for twelve years, and it's we're not a new band. And how did you end up at Columbia? At some point, it it became clear to us that we needed more than we felt Epitaph could provide. And, you know, Epitaph, they, they, they staffed up a lot. They stepped up a lot. And <clears throat> they got very good at what they did. But by the nature of who they were, they weren't going to have a presence in South America or, you know, or Asia that much, really. That was just kind of, we were licensing to Sony already in Asia anyway. So we decided we wanted some something that had a, a bigger worldwide uh, thing going on. And, um, uh, you know, it was really uh, Jim going out and, and talking to who he felt comfortable with. And we, we didn't entertain like 18 different offers or whatever. We talked to just one or two guys and, and I really liked Columbia from the very beginning. And I liked, they, they came across very much as we're very artist friendly. Uh, you know, back in those days, I don't think people don't even care now that they, the, the worry was that the label was going to control you and make you change your sound and all that. Right. And, and we never got that vibe from Columbia at all. I think we were in a we were in a fortunate position already that we were coming in off a record that had sold whatever ten million records. So we definitely were able to tell the label, "Don't bug us. We're just going to do what we want to do." And they were pretty content with that because we had a track record. So you go for a long ride on Columbia. What's your experience of that? I really liked Columbia. I know it's so you know easy to, to bag on a label or say they did something bad to you or whatever, but I always enjoyed working with them. And, um, you know, we had, uh, Americana was a successful record. So we had some, some, some great success working with them. Um, we eventually we extended our contract by a couple of records and we did a greatest hits record and stuff. So believe it or not, we did seven albums on Columbia. And, uh, I like to say that I think we may be one of the only bands to actually finish their record contract where we didn't, we didn't get dropped. We actually finished the contract. And any thought of staying at Columbia? I think we put out the feelers and they were, they seemed happy to move on at that point, frankly. <laughs> so how did you end up with this album at Concord? Yeah, well, we had, you know, we're free agents. We didn't have anything to work on and we were touring a lot. And like I said, recording in shorter bursts. So we kind of just took our time and didn't really look for a label for a while. And, uh, I think there were some very basic conversations with some labels like Warner or Caroline or whatever. And I think um, it was basically um, <clears throat> Concord kind of reaching out and saying, well, we'd like to talk to these guys and went in and met, met with Tom Wally and the people there. And it was, it was really great. Christmas night, 1980 at RAF Bentwaters. An airman on patrol sees something descend from the sky and into the forest outside the base. There was like an orangish reddish coloring in the forest and a white light. Three men enter the forest to investigate what they think must be a plane crash. But it's not a plane crash. It's something very different. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This season on Strange Arrivals, the Rendlesham Forest Incident. One of the most famous UFO sightings in history, sometimes described as Britain's Roswell. Really, what more can you say about Roswell that hasn't been said? There's an awful lot you can say about Rendlesham that hasn't been said. Find Strange Arrivals on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. And learn more at grimandmild.com. Get ready for a gloves off spin on the classic advice show with the Dear Chelsea podcast. Join comedian Chelsea Handler and her assistant slash confidant slash co-host Brandon Marlowe on the podcast that offers unvarnished, hilarious and empowering advice to people from all walks of life. Drawing from her own experiences, Chelsea brings a fresh perspective to help listeners become the person they wish they could be. Instinctively, I would always tell everybody to just like reach for their dreams and, and go for it and take a huge risk in life. It's a weekly dose of in-your-face, unfiltered Chelsea. 
oh, I've never wanted to be a mom, mm-hmm. but I could kill it as a divorcee dad. With insights and balance from Brandon along the way. And Brandon is like my little sidecar, aren't you? I am. I'm just here for moral support and a different perspective at times. Yeah, he's more reasonable than I am, so you might want to listen to what he says. Listen to Dear Chelsea on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, and what's the experience of putting a record out today in this crazy internet era where back in the old days on Columbia, pre-Napster, pre-insanity? It's so different, so completely different, right? I mean, yeah, even, you know, the internet of 2000 is nothing like the internet of of today. And even the, the metrics, the measurement is different. Like, you know, we had a number one alternative album this time in I'm calling the manager saying, is that good? <laughs> Cause <laughs> you know, I, we, I think, I think we debuted number three in the UK, which is phenomenal. And I'm, I'm thrilled, but I think that's less than 10,000 records sold. So it's like, <laughs> is it good? You know, it's kind of more of an amalgamation of, it's a combination of streaming and YouTube views and sales and whatever, you know, your social media that determines uh, how successful a record is. Well, in the old days, you gear it up, you gear up, you hopefully uh, MTV plays the video. No one has that kind of mind share anymore. No one has that kind of reach. Does that affect your interest, desire, and perspective on new work? In a way, it's kind of liberating because you can kind of be who you are and you just kind of develop whatever audience that is, right? Like, we're never going to get played on top 40. So, you know, the the whole, like you said, the MTV, that thing is kind of out. But uh, I think... Now, like I said, it, it, it it's easier to express who you are. We're doing like videos on YouTube, like a series, and we're calling it "How to with the Offspring." And on one thing, I we talk tell people how to surf, but we don't really tell them how to surf. And in another one, Noodles shows us how to bird watch, and it's kind of like it allows you to express your personality in in a broader way than you could have if it was just single and radio thing, and that's it. So you end up selling your work. How do you come to the conclusion that you want to sell it? How do you make that deal? Well, our um, our our deal with with Sony Columbia is owned by Sony, right? Of course, and um, it was actually a licensing deal. We we came in with enough uh, clout off of the Epitaph deal that we got a licensing deal. So we knew that our records were the ownership was going to come back to us at some point. And whenever that date was, it's, you know, so many years after you deliver your last record, the records came back to us and we kind of had to make a decision as the best way to go. Do we want to relicense it or make another deal or how do we want to do it? And just with the different options that were presented, we decided that we we're comfortable just selling it. And so tell us about making that deal. You know, there's there's several people out there, players out there. We ended up going with a company called Round Hill, which I... Um, I, I got along with them. I like them a lot. I feel like they're very into, you know, developing the bands. Like they're they're always they're pressing us. Like, can we do a reissue of Conspiracy of One? We do a re- they, we've done like three or four reissues already, and they're real collector sets. And so it's 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 cool. It feels like something that uh, is geared towards fans, which is important to us. Okay, those are the albums. How about the songs? What do you mean the songs? Do you still own the songs, or you sold those to Round Hill too? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, a majority, a majority of the publishing was sold as well. A majority. Me- okay. You were the primary songwriter. That didn't mean that much. It means a lot in the internet era. Was there ever any discussion about credits in the band? As far as publishing goes and stuff? Yes. You know, I mean, when you first start off, you're, you're so one for all and all for one, right? There's no money or anything anyway. <clears throat> And so on our first couple records, um, the publishing was just split evenly, uh, even though I, I did the writing. And then before we were, before Smash, I had a talk with the guys at practice and said, I feel like it would be fair for me to get the songwriting royalties because I do the songwriting. And um, they were totally okay with it. Um, you know, it's not like you get three, you know, you get five times as much as they do. It's, it's however the the money works out. It's, it's, it's a little, a little bit extra, I guess. But, uh, but fortunately it was actually pretty, pretty easy for everyone to agree on that. And also fortunately we were successful enough that 
there was there was no griping about it because everyone was was doing well. Okay, when you say you sold part of the publishing to Roundhill, does that mean you continue to own part? Well, there's there's different forms of publishing income, as you know, whether it's sync rights or radio airplay or you know. So I I didn't sell every revenue stream. Okay, uh, what'd you do with the money? <laughs> well. I put it in the bank. I'm, you know, we're not getting any oh, younger here. You put here. it in the bank. You're an intelligent guy. You're losing money if you put money in the bank. <laughs> so it's not really that simple. You have to do something with the That's money. That's right. That's right. Well, why, wisely invested, I hope. I hope. Uh, I did buy a plane. That was my, my treat to myself. Okay. You owned a plane previously, though, right? Yes. Okay. Jim told me you own a jet. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, you wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. You didn't go. When did you get your pilot's license, and when did you buy your first plane? That was all after Smash. We came back, you know, I finally had enough money to take uh, flying lessons. I, I would have never um, never been able to afford that before then. <clears throat> and I don't know, it probably cost $5,000 or something like that back in the day to get your license. And I did it, and... You know, when I talked before about how some things you think you're going to like, but you're not sure, this was one of those things that just, for me, just really clicked. I just, I really liked it right away. It was going to be my, my golf, if, if you know what I mean. And uh, I bought, bought my first airplane shortly after I got my license, a, a propeller plane. Okay. And at that point, when were you uh, instrument rated? Oh, well, almost right away. Um, I know pe- people out there may not know a lot about flying, but instrument rating is very important to me, especially it was very important. People, they kind of inadvertently get in the clouds. And if you can't fly in, in just by instruments, you really get in trouble. So I knew that that was something I wanted to make a priority. So I got instrument rated within, I don't know, within a year of getting my license. So walk us through your ownership history of airplanes. <laughs> uh, well, when I got my license, I was, I was renting. I, I got my license from uh, a local airport here. And decided I wanted to buy a plane, so I bought a plane called a Mooney, and uh, it's a, a four-seater, single-engine propeller plane. And I, I really, I loved it, <clears throat> and uh, I still have it to this day. So, but um, I wanted to go, you know, farther and faster, <laughs> so I ended up buying a King Air, and uh, I love the King Air for its its uh, for it's very comfy inside, but it wasn't very fast, so I ended up moving up to a Citation. And uh, I've sort of traded up and down over the years. I, I, this, I, I'm on my fourth, fourth citation now. Okay. So you have the Mooney and you have the citation. Those are the only two or you have anything else? Uh, that's, that's all I have. Okay. Let's talk citations for a second. <laughs> Please. I know. There's the Citation <laughs> X. Uh, when uh-huh. I've seen it, you know, Citation X, I don't know whether that's 10. And they say that can fly slightly faster tell us the different citations and which one you own okay we've really gone on a tangent here huh uh yeah well the 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 x is really a roman numeral 10 that's called a citation 10 and keeping this very simple the citations kind of go up in number a one a two a three a four a five and the 10 is the biggest one and the fastest one it is a little bit faster than commercial airlines and it's great um the one i have is more on the one level and what i like about these is they're single pilot certified, so you don't have to have two guys in the cockpit. So <clears throat> because I'm rated for it, I can I can take the jet up whenever and wherever I, I want to go, and I really love that feeling. What's the logic between the one pilot and the two pilot? Uh, I, well, I mean, I think back in the day, there were uh, pretty complicated systems to manage, and it kind of took two guys to, to do it, and they've sort of managed to simplify it over the years where it really is something that one guy, one competent pilot can handle. So why, if you fly in a 10, do they have two? At some point, I, I you know, it's a, an FAA thing. I think once when a plane's big enough, they just don't like the idea of something that big being flown by one guy. So I'm sure there's a number of reasons. Okay. So you have a citation one now, when was that plane built? Yeah. yeah the one, one I have is called a CJ one and it was built in uh, 2004. 2004. And who'd you buy it from? Uh, it, it was, yeah, it was sold back to Citation, Cessna makes Citation. And so they kind of have their own inventory and, uh, bought it from, from their, you know, it's like their used car lot. Okay. So where is it today? Uh, I keep it here in, in LA. 
Now, we're in L.A. I'm not, not going to go check out your plate, but I mean, there's a, <laughs> is it in Orange County? Is it in Van Nuys? Where is it? I, I'm based at the Long Beach Airport. Okay. How often do you take it out? About once a week. Once a week. And if you go out once a week, where might you go? Uh, uh, I, I like Lake Havasu a lot. Or, uh, you know, it, you, you'll find somewhere to go, believe me. <laughs> I like going down to Baja. Cabo is great. You know, Vegas is very close. That kind of thing. You will land there and hang out and then fly back? Or you just fly and look out what's going around? Sure, land. Have some fun. Okay. <laughs> so how many people can fly on the uh, your plane? It'll hold seven. Okay. So you should fly once a week. How often are you out there alone? How often are you out there with other people? About half half the time I have my family with me and half the time I'm by myself. Okay. How much does it cost an hour to fly the plane? <laughs> Uh, well, we're really getting into the, into this, huh? Uh, yeah. Thousand bucks an hour, 1500 bucks an hour. Thousand bucks an hour is cheap. Well, if you do everything yourself, you can actually, you can mitigate the cost quite a bit. So like I deal with scheduling the maintenance and you know, all the stuff that you would normally hire a full-time pilot to do. I, I generally take care of, and that helps the cost a lot. And then what kind of maintenance is required? Uh, I mean, there's all the tune-up stuff, you know, like, you know, in a car, you go in every whatever, 3,000 miles or 6,000 miles. In in the jet, everything's on a different schedule because the battery needs to be checked every year and something else needs to be checked every nine months. So it's almost like every three months, there's something that needs to get looked at. I mean, obviously, you know, you can't pull over in the sky if you got a problem with the plane. So th the maintenance is very meticulous. Uh, and so that's why there's so much more attention on maintenance. And the maintenance is done at your where the uh, the plane is held in Long Beach. I mean, there are mechanics around. I generally go to Lake Havasu for maintenance. You go to where for maintenance? You said Lake Havasu. Okay, so you have the plane, and you know what needs to be done, and you fly to Lake Havasu. How long is it going to take him to do the maintenance? Depends, right? Sometimes they need it for a few days, or sometimes it's in in and out in an afternoon. And you go to those people because they're cheap. You trust them. I have a relationship Why? with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I actually, uh, I lived in Lake Havasu for a few years. Ah. So, what was that like? <laughs> That's like a resort area. I've never even been there. <laughs> yeah. It is. Uh, well, I love it. I'll just say that to start with. But, you know, very different from California, right? It's very much, you know, people carry guns. You know, they. they it's not even a conceal and carry it's just you just strap it on and you know they're not wearing masks in Lake Havasu let's put it that way it's a, <laughs> <laughs> but you know I, I like the spirit out there too I think that's that's cool that they're you know very freedom oriented and I, I like that and of course I I like that in California people are 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 careful and are you a big water sports guy yeah my my parents always took us our whole family to uh to Lake Havasu uh, for summer vacation. So we grew up water skiing and stuff. Okay. So n not being a pilot and being anxious, generally speaking, if you, you to the schedule of repair, you're not going to have a problem or could you have a problem up there anyway? I mean, it's mechanical, mechanical things break for sure. I mean, on the one hand, that's why in general, there's two of everything on a jet. Or have you ever noticed there's two engines and, two yokes, two steering wheels, you know, two radios, two two of almost everything so that you're you you're hopefully you'll be okay if something breaks. But I mean that is a a mental outlook that you have to have that like look, I might have an emergency and I need to be able to be prepared to to deal with that, to know that, that might happen and so that's why training is also very important. I go, I go to a place in Texas twice a year and train for a few days at a time and we go over emergencies extensively. Okay, so what's the worst emergency you've had? Actual emergency? Yes. Well, fortunately, in the yeah, in the real world, you know, these planes are really reliable. So, uh, you know, um, actually, I, I had a light come on once that said you might have a clog in your fuel system, and it means you should land right away. Uh, I was over Palm Springs, so I landed, and it turned out it was just a faulty light. So I didn't have a problem, but <laughs> it looked like I might have a major problem if I didn't land quickly. And how about just experience flying? You ever have a bad experience? Uh, <clears throat> well, I almost flew over the bush ranch once. 
I uh, I was flying in Texas and, you know, and generally you're on with air traffic controllers, but I just felt like being not talking to anybody, which, which you can, it's perfectly legal and you can do as long as you stay within certain parameters, you can't go too high, blah, blah. But one of the, one of the, the main things you have to do flying, they call this VFR is that you have to make sure you don't go into any airspace, uh, <clears throat> you know, around here, it'd be LAX for example, or something. So I was cruising along and I actually did talk to a controller for a minute and said, blah, blah, blah. And he, he said, okay, yeah, go ahead and go to wherever you're going. He goes, and don't forget about the bush ranch there. <laughs> I'm like, what? And I'm looking around and all of a sudden, this is before we had those great screens of GPS. I'm like, holy fuck, where's the, where's the bush ranch? And so I wasn't sure what to do. So I just took a hard left and went like 50 miles the other way to make sure I didn't uh, accidentally go over that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do that. You'd get in big trouble. Okay, Jim told me that you flew them to Telluride. I didn't get this deep, but I have to ask you, did you take them in to the Telluride airport, right in Telluride? I didn't. Um, Because that's like one of the scariest airports of all time. That's why I ask. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it would be fun to fly into, but, you know, if I'm flying somebody and their family, I don't need that level of excitement. So, you know, I might... I might bring another pilot. You know, I, I, uh, if we ever take the plane on tour, I always bring a pilot. So that's one thing that you can do to help the situation. But what we do is we land at Montrose. It's just, it's about an, it's, it's like at the bottom of the mountain. It's down the hill. Right. I've been there, but okay. It, let's assume you took another pilot. What would that add to your situation? What kind of situation? No, you say, if I was going to go into a hairy airport, I might bring another pilot. What would be the thinking there? Oh, well, like if we're, for example, if we're on tour, I'll bring another pilot just because I don't be, I don't want to be responsible for everything in the plane and then going to do the show and then coming back to the airport and making sure that the gas got on the plane and the credit card, you know, bill was paid and all that stuff. So it's really just offloading the responsibilities of, of, of being, in, uh, you know, being in charge of the airplane. So when you go on tour, you do take your plane? Um, in North America, generally. Not always. It depends on a couple of factors, but. Okay. Well, some, uh, you know, big acts, they have a base and they'll fly out for every gig. Like they'll base in Chicago and they'll go to different gigs. How do you do it? Sure. Hubbing. I love hubbing. It's great. <laughs> you know, the, the small pleasures you, you get used to, you know, I don't mind being on a bus, but you know, we've been on a bus for 25 years. Like, you know, it, it does get old after a while. And the idea of you go into the place, you check in, you don't bother to unpack because you're going to be leaving the next day. Right. So the idea of being in one place, one hotel for five or six nights is really appealing. Right. But of course it, it makes the cost go way up because you're flying twice as far you're going back. So you have to take that into consideration, whether it's worth it. So I'd say, you know, we, we hub generally like in New York, maybe, uh, cause the East coast stuff is all pretty convenient to get to. And other than that, we tend to hop from place to place. Okay. But that plane can't fly all your gear. No, no, just the band, just the band. Let's switch gears. You have this hot sauce and I take all these vanity projects with a grain of salt. Also talking about food, but yours is the best Vanity hot sauce I've ever, and I, you know, I use it on a regular basis. For a long time, I was hooked on the green, thinking there was a little too much bite in the hotter one, but I go back and forth now. So tell us about the development of the hot sauce. Well, I got to say, look, I, I feel like I must be the luckiest guy in the music business because I've gotten a positive review from you on a song and a hot sauce. I mean, it well, never happens. Well, you're doing happens. something right here, Dexter. <laughs> it never happens. Uh, uh, you know, growing up in Southern California, just, you know, Mexican food was always part of the deal. And I, I love Mexican food and I, I love the culture here and hot sauce was part of it. And it was almost just like on a whim one day looking at the bottle while I'm pouring it on a taco, like it'd be funny to make a hot sauce. Like it was just like that much of a random thought. And I just thought, you know, I think I'm, I'm going to do this because it would be real. It would be funny. That was kind of the, the, the only reason the impetus. And, but I didn't know how to, I don't know how to cook. So, but I mean, well, shit, we didn't know how to play guitars. That didn't stop us from starting a band. So <laughs> I won't, I won't let cooking stop me from making a hot sauce. So, uh, you know, where do you go? You go to the internet. This is probably 15 years ago. So there were not really recipes for hot sauce on the internet. There's a lot of salsa recipes, but not so much for hot sauce. So that really took a lot more figuring out. It took me a couple years to get a recipe together that I liked and, uh, finally got this together 
and decided to make Christmas presents out of it. I'm going to send it to my buddies and my accountant, <laughs> that kind of thing. And the feedback was really, really phenomenal. They're like, this is good. Like, oh, thank you. Like, no, dude, this is, you got to put this out. This is really good. So they kind of encouraged me to try to release it. Okay. From the commercial perspective, there are three. Which one did you send to your buddies? The first one was the red. That's kind of your general all-purpose hot sauce. Right. And then how did you decide you were going to have three? Uh, well, I mean, I think the, the main idea with, with, with my hot sauce is I wanted a, a Mexican style hot sauce, which means generally less vinegary. And I, I wanted it to taste good and not just be hot. I think a lot of brands, they're, they're caught up in the idea of we want to, you know, burn your ass off and <clears throat> they don't taste very good. So, but I think a, a red and a green is just kind of natural, uh, two sides of the coin. Right. So, so I always knew I was going to do a green. And then as, as that went on, you know, you can, you can see over the last decade, people's palates are changing and people are into spicy stuff way more than they were. So there was kind of this demand for a, a extra spicy one. That's why I did the super hot. Is this a business? When you say business <laughs> in, 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 a, in, a, in a, yeah, in a vague sense. Uh, no, I mean, we, we actually, uh, we pay the bills, but barely. Okay. So you can buy it on Amazon. How much availability is there outside that? Yeah. I mean, uh, my, my goal on this was to be just kind of a regular supermarket brand, not, not trying to be a boutique brand. And, you know, I, I kind of want to get it out there. So you go after the big chains, you know, we, we got into Kroger, which is a really big one. That one's like 2000 stores nationally by itself. So Amazon is, is huge for us. It's been great. Um, but I think we're probably in about uh, 4,000 stores, four or 5,000 stores in the U S. Yeah. What do you know? What would I know about a store is you can get in, but if it doesn't sell, they pull it. Yes. Yeah. That was the other thing I didn't know about the hot sauce business, the grocery business. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's slotting fees. It, I mean, that's uh, like a crazy business. It's a lot more fun to create a hot sauce and create a brand than it is to actually do the work and, and sell it. How many people are working on the hot sauce business? We've, we've got about four people in the office. It's a, it's a small company. It's, you know, a real labor of love. Um, I like it cause it's like, I feel like it's, I don't know. It's a, it's a calling card. It's a, it's a, it's a fun thing to give to people and people kind of get a kick out of it, you know, when they see, you know, it's like pizza. Everybody likes pizza. <laughs> Here's a bottle of hot sauce. Okay. And marketing, what is keeping people buying it? Yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I knew that I didn't want to do traditional marketing. I, you know, when, when I, I, I used to have a record label a long time ago and I just didn't believe that the magazine ads really did anything. Um, at least not at this level. Maybe if you're, a giant company, then that constant presence is important. But I wanted it to just be word of mouth. So I was trying to sell it to restaurants and, and just get, you know, good reviews online. And it's still kind of where it's at. It's very much a word of mouth kind of product. Okay. You're Dexter because, cause that's not your given name. No, no. My real name is Brian. Uh, I, I, uh, Again, going back to all our influences, the punk rock influences, they always had kind of wacky names. And I liked that. And I, and I liked that, you know, in the rock world, you'd be like, I, I don't know, it'd be some really cool name, Ian or something like that, you know, Magnus or something. And I, I thought it was funny to do something that was the opposite of that. And to me, Dexter just seemed like the complete opposite of a cool name. And you just came up with it yourself? I just like that. Yeah. I mean, the descendants, their singer's name is Milo, which I think it's, it makes it, because he's, the songs are so rad. I love the descendants and having him be named Milo, it made him even cooler, I thought. Okay. Now, how about going back to finish your degree? How did you decide to do that? And how did you actually squeeze it in? Yeah. The USC was a leave of absence. So technically I didn't, I wasn't gone from USC, but I think it's only supposed to, it's supposed to expire after a few years. And you know, we were really busy for a long time. And I think it was like, you know, geez, 15 years, almost 20 years later that I started thinking about it going, gosh, that's always been, it's going to be on my bucket list, but geez, it's going to be a lot to do, but it didn't seem so imperative. Like we have to get a record out this year, the way it did, you know, 10 years before. So I went back and visited with a couple of my old professors and it, it was great. And they kind of told me that the door would probably be open still. 
and that they would kind of, they would sign off on it and let me come back if I wanted to finish. They encouraged me to do it. And I, I decided to do it because I, I knew that that door would not be open too many more years, right? They would retire or go away or, you know, it'd just be too long. So I decided to, to go back thinking that I could probably finish this in a couple years. I had done quite a bit of work by the time the band took off. Um, I had taken all the exams and the coursework and they call, um, you're a candidate and they call that all but dissertation. So I had done everything but the dissertation and not that the dissertation is a small piece. It's a big chunk of work, but, um, I thought, well, I can go back and just kind of, you know, maybe knock this out in a year or two. And, uh, you know, there I was, it was five years actually going in five back. years. How much time dedicated to it? Well, that's the thing too. It was a part-time endeavor for sure. You know, I was uh, you know, a couple days a week is all the time I really could spend on it. Wow. I mean, did you ever sit and think, why the hell am I doing this? <laughs> I definitely did. Halfway through. Yeah, it, it was tough because there was, you know, technology moves fast. There was definitely, I, I had to come up to speed on what had happened in biotech in the last 20 years. So that took a while. And then when I say all about dissertation, I didn't know what my dissertation was going to be. So there was that searching process of finding something that I wanted to do, something that you know, the, the thing about your dissertation, it has to be publishable research, means it, meaning it has to be something no one's done before. And finding something like, oh, shit, somebody did that, you know, that that takes a while. That's a process. So it was definitely there was there was some, yeah, some some soul searching, wondering if I was really doing the right thing by going back to finish this because the end wasn't in sight for a while. OK, you published it. Did it have any impact? You know. Usually they don't, <laughs> but you just built it up so big, I wonder if it did. Oh, yeah. Well, in order to find this niche, you got to really dig deep. You get into the stuff that's so esoteric that, you know, that not many people are even in that zone. So um, my thesis was was published in the, the, the USC library. Um, the idea is to go back and, and tease them out a little bit more and make actual research papers. So it hasn't been published like in uh, in that in that sense, but it's been cited, you know, uh, thirty two times, something like okay, that. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'll okay. take it. So now you're done with it, or are you keeping your hand in biotech? Well, I'm keeping up with the reading, and uh, my 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 goal is once we finish all this record promo, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to write a paper or two this summer. Okay, and in the next thirty or forty years. Are you a musician? Are you someone living a life of leisure? Are you a scientist? Or you have no fucking clue? What is it? Yeah. I mean, look, first and foremost, I, I love the band. It's it's obviously what I've I've steered my life towards, you know, consciously and unconsciously. So I don't know if I'd ever give that up for sure, but I just you know, there's so much interesting stuff out there. That's and so I like obviously dabbling in different stuff, whether it's aviation or hot sauce, you know, really different kinds of things. So I, I hope to always be busy doing something. I don't see myself retiring like let's assume golf you're, course. Let's assume you're <coughs> excuse me, off cycle. You're not making a record. You're not on the road. What does a typical Dexter day look like? Yeah. Uh, you know, flying, going to the beach. We, we live pretty close to the beach here, which is great. Um, I have little ones now, so that, um, as any parent knows, takes up a good chunk of your day. And it's so much fun. Gosh, just that age of having the little ones. They're just, they just how crack little, me up. How, what age are they? Uh, five and two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and just it's just so great just watching them run around and chase each other and laugh at the silliest things. And just it really, it puts life into, you know, as you know, a whole a different perspective. Well, actually, I don't know because I don't have kids, but I hear about it. But how did you decide at this late date you would take that plunge? Yeah, I, I always, I wasn't sure. I wasn't decidedly that I wasn't going to have kids. I just didn't want to have kids then. So, you know, I think I, years later, I'm a little older. Uh, I'm a little more settled. I'm in a new marriage. And it just kind of felt, it felt right to, to do it. And I'm really, now, I mean, geez, I'm really glad I did. Okay, Dexter, this has been great. Thanks for illuminating all these issues. Hopefully people will hear your record. You know, the album, et cetera. Just one thing, you know, where does the sense of humor come from in the records? Because this is rare in the music world. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it's 
insecurity. <laughs> I think when, when bands try to come across too serious, it kind of turns me off in a way. But I think just, uh, yeah, just having something you can kind of have a laugh at. And music's supposed to make you feel good at the end of the day, whether it's, it can be therapeutic. It doesn't have to be a happy song. It can be a depressing song. But if it's something that's cathartic, that'll make you feel good. That's one way. And humor is another way. Okay. And for those people who are not big into offspring, play the latest version of Gone Away. You're really going to be blown away. And hopefully more people hear it. While we all desperately ached for escapism, Bridgerton, the Shondaland smash on Netflix, came streaming along. Now we wait for season two. But in the meantime, you can hear how this show came to life with the cast, the production team, and the creators of Bridgerton. Listen to Bridgerton, the official podcast, on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you get your favorite shows. If you ever listen and wonder, who recorded this? A lot of people have looked, and it's really still not clear. And why? There were over 700 unmarked cassettes and reels. Why bother recording something at all? I wasn't sure if anybody was listening. Or was this recorded? Ephemeral is back. Listen and subscribe to Ephemeral now on the iHeartRadio app. 